I'll invite up the uh, guests in a second, but before I do, let me just uh, kind of intro uh, what this has been doing. We haven't been together for about a month, and then we're not going to be together for another month, and I know that last time we had, a, I, I guess, a, a discussion on stage with these chairs, and it worked so well, we thought, why not do it twice? Uh, no, the reason we're actually doing it is because uh, we're, tonight, we're in the middle of our series called Jesus and the World Religions, and we're looking at Jesus' perspective on the world religions. If you've been following with us for the last few months, uh, we've looked at religions such as Islam, Mormonism, and theological liberalism. Then we took a little bit of a break, heard from uh, Brennan and Sarah and their story. This week, we're coming back, and we're actually doing Sikhism. And so I think for a lot of us, anyone who has grown up and lived in Abbotsford, this is something we are consistently surrounded by, is Sikhism. And so the goal uh, of the every single talk that we've been doing has actually been been to portray the religion, hopefully fairly, and then to show um, Christianity at the same time and show how we find our hope in Christianity and looking at various different um, areas and various different doctrines and sometimes comparing them. So tonight we want to be doing this with Sikhism, and I figured the best way uh, is not to have me tell you about it, but to actually have people who have um, grown up in this and people who have worked uh, and, they, and, can, and are still working uh, with Sikhs in our community. So this evening we're going to be hearing from Sam Graywell and also our very own Imran Daniel, and they are going to be sharing this evening. So why don't you guys come on up and would you welcome our guests? Hello, Sam. Hello, Hi. Imran. Is your mic on? Mine is on. That thing, oh, right? there you go, Imran. Good to see you. Yep, should be on? Try talking. Hi. Hi. Can you hear her? Okay. Good. Good to see you. Well, why don't you guys introduce yourselves, tell us your name, uh, tell us your place of birth, and then uh, for something fun, tell us what your favorite birthday memory was. Okay, my name is Sam. Um, I grew up in Ontario in a small town called Stony Creek. Um, I'm, I'm a former intern here and I'm a current seminary student. Uh, my favorite birthday memory, um, so something that everyone needs to know about me is that I really love Star Wars. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so my favorite birthday party uh, was a Star Wars themed birthday party. So lightsabers, Darth Vader, um, and my parents surprised me with a Yoda cake. Oh, so, <laughs> so we ate Yoda's face. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, so it was... It was so I guess the most important question, Sam, is what are your thoughts on The Last Jedi? <laughs> I personally really loved it, but I'm thinking Daniel did not. <laughs> nope, that's another time, another sermon. Okay. Imran. So um, this is my first time, by the way, before uh, I say anything else. And I was sitting at the back, and I, I want you to tell you guys that I'm very proud of you guys. I was watching you guys worship as the band was leading. It was just incredible to see you guys all just worshiping you wholeheartedly. Because um, I often cause I laugh at the, like, you know, young adults. Of course, guys and girls come just to meet each other. You know, of course, there's truth to that. Uh, but, but, but it was just incredible to see you guys. So keep that going. Um, so my name is Imran, one of the pastors here. Um, I was born and raised in Pakistan. Um, in a small village, which is one of the largest village in the country, uh, uh, Christian village. And my favorite uh, birthday memory is, I love trifle. So, uh, so basically, I didn't expect that year that I'm going to have trifle. You, you, you know, you, you, you expect those normal uh, cakes and stuff, but all of a sudden, like, I was surprised basically with the trifle, and I was just like, that was my uh, dinner, breakfast, and lunch the next day. Loved it. So, uh, trifle still is my favorite. So. so, yeah. Anything else, Daniel? Well, Imran loves trifle. There's also something else that Imran really loves. Um, Sam, you know from working in the office, the office is consistently up there at Northview, uh, just full of shenanigans. And uh, one of the ones that I had found myself in the middle of was uh, the, the tale of Imran's mango shake. Now, Imran, every day, uh, most days, shows up to work with, uh, it's like one of those magic bullets that makes uh, a, like a milkshake, except it's not a small magic bullet. The thing is about this big. 
and it's this big tube of yellow drink. And one day I said to Imran, what, what is this? What are you drinking? Hey, man, it's my mango shake. <laughs> and, 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 and so he, every single day, Imran brings mango shake. And the next day, I find out that Danny was drinking out of my mango shake that was sitting in the fridge. And Luke recorded it. Well, and he texted me a video of him <laughs> drinking it. So that's one occasion. Another time, I left my mango shake in the stout fridge. Apparently, I didn't give it to him. I didn't share with him. And what he does, I think he put a Sprite or 7-Up in it. So I go to the lunchroom and I like sip of them. I'm like, this does not taste good. It was just gross. So I had to dump the whole thing. I asked Daniel, Daniel, did you do anything with my mango shake? No, man, I didn't do anything. And that's the honest truth. I have not, I never touched his mango shake. The whole point was, don't believe we, you. Luke took a photo of me and I was pretending to drink it and he well, sent the photo. It was a video, okay? I never drank the mango shake. I swear, I swear to this day, I, I never drank the mango shake. You let me taste it one time. Yeah. But I would never, these other times, it was not me, so... <laughs> Look elsewhere, Imran. Anyways, we have a lot of fun. Um, I guess to start, as we look at the, the topic of, of Sikhism, now am I saying that right? Because I've heard different, sometimes we call it Sikhism or is it Sikhism? What's the p- proper pronouncement? The official is Sikhism, but we're okay with Sikhism. Cool. All right. Just because you're white, you can't say it properly. So. <laughs> I, I, I just heard Daniel butcher my name to, I just told... Um, Andy as well, like he just butchered my Imran. I was like, that's just so white of you to say it. Like, so okay, I still love you, man. And I'll give you some of my mango shake next time. I can't wait. Um, to start, I want to talk about stereotypes. As we look at Sikhism or Sikhism, Imran, you like that? As we look at that, <laughs> as we look at Sikhism and we look at um, the various stereotypes surrounding Sikhism, but also uh, Punjabi culture, could you guys share on some of these stereotypes that you're often having to correct people on uh, when we approach this discussion and, and discussion about this religion? Um, so I think one of the major ones is not a lot of people know what Sikhism is actually even about. Um, so it kind of gets mistaken for other religions. Um, so especially Islam is one of the major ones because they both both wear turbans. So not understanding that is probably one of the major ones. Um, and the one that I kind of get a lot, like culturally, is a question, which is like, why do you guys have um, such long weddings? So like our weddings last like five days. <laughs> and, um, and I know like, Canadian weddings are just usually like just an evening. They run out of money. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I have two sisters and they're both married now. And I took off two weeks off of work to um, go to Ontario and take part in the wedding. And a lot of my friends were like, why are you taking two weeks off? Like it's just only a day, right? And so, no, it's actually five days long, and we have different ceremonies and different meanings behind each day, and each day leads up to the wedding and then the reception. So that's one of the major ones I find. Um, well, one of the other ones is also that y- you see a brown-skinned uh, person, and people think that they all seek people, uh, whereas... Being a brown doesn't mean that you're Sikh. You could be Muslim, you could be a Christian. So people often mistake that, uh, that, uh, that hey, are you Sikh? Do you go to the temple? Um, someone, one of my friends was telling me who come to Northview, um, and they said that actually she and her husband been coming here for three years now, and she's like, people see her often, and they're like, hey, welcome here. Is this your first time? And she's like, I'm just kind of getting tired of this because people have no idea. They just think that I just came here now, right? So, so uh, often there's misunderstanding. Um, some of the other misunderstandings or stereotypes, like, you know, they come and take our jobs. Tim Hortons, uh, Artem Alvon, like you, you see all my people there. Uh, <laughs> they love serving you guys because you guys can't make your own coffee, okay? <laughs> um, and then you guys complain, man, this coffee doesn't taste good. Because they're used to making chai, not coffee. So get over it. Um, 
I actually, uh, I have a video here, if we could play in a second. Let me give you a bit, bit of background here. So uh, I recently watched a movie, um, and in the movie, this lady who comes from India um, to attend her sister's Hanisa's wedding in New York, first time ever in North America, she comes and then she basically, she's super excited to go out to a coffee shop and um, buy a coffee. So I'll, I'll let you watch it and then I'll, we'll just talk about that after. So can we play the video please for a second? It's four minutes, so j just uh, bear with me here. How you doing today, ma'am? I want to... Uh... I asked how you were doing today. Doing, I'm doing... I'm doing... Um, um, you can't take all that time. I got a long line here. Sorry, what to eat? Are you kidding me right now? Please hurry up, lady. Vegetarian? Vegetarian is fine. What do you want to eat? Only vegetarian. A bagel, a wrap, a sandwich? Sandwich. Okay. And what kind of filling do you want inside? Do you want cheese, tomatoes, lettuce? Huh? Lady, do you see you are holding up my line? This is not rocket science. Cheese? Huh, oh, cheese. Yes to cheese. Anything to drink? To water. Still or sparkling? Only water. Still or sparkling? Coffee? Americano cappuccino latte. Lady, I don't got all day. Americano cappuccino latte. It's coffee. What? It's coffee. Yes, we have nice coffee. We have the best coffee in Manhattan. You know what? I'm going to give you an Americano. Small or medium? Small. Small. Is that it? $10.20. Ten dollars. $10. Sorry. Sorry. Ten dollars. Hello. The least you could do is say thank you. Sorry, thank you. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh. What are you doing? I am not cleaning that up. Don't bother. Don't bother. Sorry. What a stupid woman. Sorry. Can I, can I get another one? Thank you. So, as you watch this, um, I'm not sure if you've been in a situation like this, but a lot of people come here not knowing any English, and they, they struggle with that. And people assume that when you step into this land or in this country, you ought to speak English, you ought to speak our language, you should be fluent, otherwise stay home. Right, so so th that's another stereotype right there. Um, 
and then the, the, the other thing is like, I mean, as you saw in the video, uh, they do a great job. And it's actually true too in many situations as well that we, our, our culture is so complicated. Like you go to the coffee shop, she has no idea. Water is water, still or sparkling. Just give me some water. And then coffee, like, okay, I, it, it just kind of messes up her whole kind of order. And then just like, she's like, okay, forget it. She's already embarrassed. So a lot of people don't open their mouth uh, and they don't want to talk to any white person because they know if they open their mouth, they cannot speak properly. So therefore, they just kind of keep it to themselves. They want to talk to you guys, but they're just, just afraid how you will react. So um, th there's so bunch of applications that we can take from this as well at the end too. Like the French guy uh, who brings cafe, he's white. His skin color, language, there's a problem. If you watch the whole mo movie, language is a problem. But because of his skin color, he gets away, no problem, right? Because she's brown and there's no other brown person in the cafeteria, you will look differently. So people struggle with that. They're like, yeah, I'm brown. Uh, I'm not black or white. Uh, I don't fit in. I'm still a second class citizen. So it's a whole bunch of things uh, that the people struggle with that. That was a long answer. Oh, that's good. Good answer. Ooh. Thank you, Imran. Um, and we're going to come back to that towards the end, actually. Okay. But now what I want to do is I want to talk about the uh, religion of Sikhism um, itself, particularly what is Sikhism and you know, some of the questions, is it monotheistic? Tell us what they actually believe and tell us about the scriptures in Sikhism. Sam, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, sure. Um, so Sikhism is monotheistic, so they believe that there's one God. Um, but there's a line of spiritual teachers called gurus. Um, there's 10 human gurus, and then um, it ends with the scriptures, which is also considered to be a guru as well. Um, in our, and there's also a misconception um, that a lot of people have where they think that Sikhs hold to 10 different gods, but they actually hold to one god, and 10 different teachers have expressed the theology and the doctrine and the way of life. Um, and also, to, in order to understand Sikhism, you have to kind of go back to where it began. So it began in the late 15th century in northern India in a region called Punjab, where a lot of the Sikh people are from. And um, so, yeah, so it, it started there, and it was started by Nanak, who uh, was Hindu himself, and he saw a lot of fighting between the, um, the Hindus and the Muslims, and he it didn't sit well with them. So he has this famous famous line, which he says, "There is no, there is no um, Muslim and there is no Hindu," saying that like we all we're all people and we all worship one God, and that there's no difference between. Uh, what, what you call it, basically. Um, and so that was how Sikhism started. And so it is very much monotheistic. But their understanding of God is very different from how Christians understand it. So um, in Sikhism, God is like almost like a force, um, and that he's genderless, formless, um, and also absent. So there's some similarities in there with Christianity where God is holy, God is good, but he's also very absent and not, he doesn't intervene in people's lives. Um, so so the, it's also because Guru Nanak himself did not start this as a religion. Uh, like Sam said, that he basically saw that people were um, getting in trouble. There was no justice that was taking place. So he started this as a kind of social, uh, humanitarian kind of movement where he can stand up for those who cannot stand, for them, uh, stand up for themselves. Uh, it was the 10th guru, Guru Gobind Singh, who started, uh, made this into a religion. So long story short, so what they basically believe, uh, that if you remember God at all time, and earn honestly, and work hard, and share with others, so, so these are the three pillars of Sikhism, and also avoid five vices or five thieves, which is like lust, anger, greed, attachment to the things of this world, and ego. So if you avoid all these things and remember these three pillars of Sikhism, you can actually become part of God. So the whole idea is to get out of the cycle of death and rebirth and become or merge with God so that so that you're not going through the cycle and cycle of death and rebirth coming back and forth over and over again. So there would be no sort of hell? 
Uh, no. Well, hell, they, they would say basically that this is the coming back uh, in a different life or different form is kind of like hell. They won't say it openly, but because it, you, you come back, if you did not, if you achieved what you were supposed to achieve, you would not come back because you completed the cycle and that you merged with God. But because you did not merge with God, you, you're still missing something. So you need to go and complete that, and then you'll become part of God. Um, and to kind of look at it, it's very um, impersonable and also kind of unethical, if you think about it, because you're going through these cycles of life and death, and you don't even know how much... Um, karma you have so how, how many things in your past life are going to infect you in this life and how that changes what opportunities you have or like what kind of life you'll live um, whether you'll be in a poor you'll live in a poor family have um, not a lot of money um, not a lot of position um, in society so all those things are according to their theology dictated by karma and so in this life like to to be human is to suffer is kind of their theology um, so there actually is no hell, but hell is on earth. Um, and in order to get away from that, you have to do a lot of work. So it's called dharma. So it's like the balance between karma and dharma. And dharma is all the things that you can accomplish um, in this life on your own works. And so doing, um, helping the poor, um, being a good person, um, being involved in community, not stealing, not cheating, but all those things are kind of like God is keeping account of those things, and if you do enough of those things, then at the end of your life, when you die, um, you, instead of transmigrating from one body to another, so your soul moves from one body to another, and you enter a new life cycle, um, you will merge with the oneness that is considered to be God. And when you do that, you lose your own identity. So you just become this, um, so symbolism is a water droplet in the big ocean. So you become the ocean. You're no longer, no longer yourself. So it's very impersonable. Um, it's kind of like, what's the point? Um, so, yeah. Could you comment uh, with the Dharma? I, I notice a lot of times um, <coughs> Sikhs wear turbans. Can you, is that part of uh, the works? Could you explain a little bit about that? And then could you also comment on their view of scriptures? So the, the, way, the reason they wear turban, uh, some people, so if you're baptized Sikh, so there are five Ks. So, they, so there's a special ceremony called Khalsa. So if you go to this baptismal ceremony uh, at the temple, uh, you are given five Ks. But there are some people who are not baptized Sikhs, but they basically, just because they're born into a Sikh family, so they will take one of the five Ks. So for example, hey, I'm going to have long hair. Turban has nothing to do with, with their faith. It's all hair that's under the turban. Um, so the, they think the long hair is a gift from God. Therefore, you're not uh, supposed to cut or remove hair from your body because it's from a gift, girl, gift from God. So Ivan, uh, my intern, and we were actually at one of our uh, friend's house yesterday, and um, I asked uh, the mom, so, because she's baptized six, I'm like, so you would never trim your hair or wouldn't do anything like that. She's like, no, because I have, um, so this word is like, I have um, taken the Amra Shak, which is kind of like, what do you say? It's kind of like communion kind of thing, or it's a special, uh, you, you have taken part in this baptismal ceremony, therefore you can't do anything. Were you, you going to add something? Yeah, so it's similar to baptism, um, and so it's almost like in Sikhism, there's like a two-tier salvation. So there's the common cultural Sikhism that you're born to a Sikh family, so you follow the traditions, the customs, you go, you go to Gudwara, which is the Sikh temple. And then the second tier would be if you want to and you feel that you want to be more involved in what Sikhism has to do, then you would do a baptism sort of uh, ritual or a process. And, and, and there's more rules that go along with that. And so, like, you can't cut your hair. Um, you can't eat food um, from a container that's been used by somebody else. So you can't share food with anybody. Um, you have to wear special garments. You have to hold, um, you, you have to pray at certain times. Um, so there's a lot more involved. So anyway, so as I'm talking to this lady, um, so I'm like, so you're not supposed to cut, cut your hair because it's a gift from God. She's like, yeah. So what about your nails then? You shouldn't trim them either. 
And she, she was totally speechless. She had no idea how to answer that question. Because it, 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 half of the things they do is, is just cultural. And the other half are religion. So most of the people do not know whether certain practices they do, whether they're cultural or religious. Because they grew up in a Sikh home, and they take pride in that, that, hey, I'm a Sikh uh, person, or I'm born into a Sikh family. Uh, in fact, she said, like, you know, when she comes to church here, to our events or send it to ESL classes or different other things, she's like, sometimes I am afraid what some of the people are thinking, that she's a baptized Sikh, and she still goes to church. So there's that fear as well that you're not supposed to go to church. So, so anyway, so turban has nothing to do with this. Turban is just there to cover your hair that are given by God. Does that answer your question? Yeah, totally. And the scriptures. So scripture is, uh, is very sacred. Scripture is uh, writing of all these 10 gurus. So the last guru, Gobind Singh, it was started by, so basically, uh, Guru Gobind Singh, who's the 10th guru. So they all collected the writings of all these previous nine gurus, including the 10th guru, and they put it into a book form. And they said, because we need to stop this here now. If we don't stop um, all these gurus, then there's no difference between us and the Hindus. Because by 2018, you, you will have millions of gurus, just like the Hindus have millions of God. So what's the difference if we're trying to say, hey, we're separated from these guys? So we need to stop that and just kind of compile their writing, make into a book, and that is our instructions how to live out our faith. Because these guys, these teachers, these gurus have taught us how to know God and how to love God better. So, so the book itself is basically considered a living uh, guru, a living human being. Do you want to add anything else to that? Yeah. Um, so in terms of what actually is contained um, in the scriptures, it is all poet- poetry. So um, that's really open to interpretation of what it means. Um, and in terms of reliability and um, preservation of the scriptures, um, it only, there's only one auth- authorized printing press. Um, in the world that actually makes it. Um, so it's found in Amritsar, which is where the Golden Temple in India is found. And all, every single scripture of Sikhism comes from there. And they want to make sure that there are no uh, misprints, no copies, and that they can actually trust what's being said. They, by the way, so when they bring it from India to Canada or other parts of the world, they bring it on a plane. So each book... Have, it has its own seat in the plane, okay? So just like living, you, someone, one of us go and sits on the seat, like you, this book, each book has its own seat. It's just hilarious. But, but they have this, that kind of respect for this because they think this book is a living book. Um, so if the book is getting old, they're basically kind of like cremate the book and take the ashes and just Whatever people do with the living body, when someone dies and you do with the ashes, it's just like that kind of process. It's very interesting how they do this. So the respect is way up there, unlike us. Uh, just a little side note since I'm on it. Um, so, you, so you know, when you guys come to churches um, or home, uh, you, you have like a whole bunch of translation of the Bible. You go home and you leave your Bible on the floor, Right? If a Punjabi person, a Sikh person, walks into your home or a church building and they see your Bible on the floor, this is what they will tell you. You do not know how to respect your book. How do you ask me to follow this Jesus? And you'd be speechless because you have no idea. This book, to them, gives me life, how to live. So if I cannot respect there's, there's no point. Yes, I understand the argument like, yeah, it's just a book, totally. But to them, to even the Muslims, the Muslims wrap the Quran in certain ways, in a green cloth, has to be up there. So when I was growing up, so we have a shelf up there at home. So the, you have to have Bible up there, right, above your head. It's authoritative. So you read it, pick it, put it back there. Um, I think it was Spurgeon uh, at one time he said, so... There was a time the Bible was supposed to be up there, but in our culture now, the Bibles don't hear the cultures up there. So it's totally upside down now. So, so when you're trying to engage with a Sikh person, try to uh, be careful how you uh, treat your book that you believe in. 
Could you guys tell um, a bit of your story as to why you are Christians? And Sam, I believe you grew up in a, in a Sikh family. And could you share uh, your story about um, how you became a Christian, but also the difficulties that have come uh, as a result of that? And then Imran, if you could share a little bit as well. Sure. Um, so yeah, I was born in Ontario um, in a Sikh family. Um, growing up, I always had a lot of questions for my, um, my mom and my dad about like, why do we believe what we believe? Um, so I would ask them like, where, where do we come from? And like, who is God and where does he come from? And so all these questions that they really didn't know how to answer because for them, their faith was very cultural. It was like their grandparents, um, they were Sikh and they would go to the temple, not regularly, just every now and then. Um, and that was how they expressed their faith. And it was a lot of like understanding that a lot of the gurus actually went through a lot of um, persecution and martyrdom. So they didn't want to let go of that. The fact that like, that these gurus believed so much uh, about what they believe that they were willing to die for that. And so to go from a different faith for them would be really hard to understand, like why would we give up what our ancestors went through? Um, so that was kind of like their reasoning for why they believed, and that's what we, we were taught. And we were also taught that like um, all the different <coughs> cultures and all the different religions, whether you're Sikh, you're Hindu, you're Muslim, you're Christian, um, that they all are like roads going to the same God. And so it doesn't matter what you are, that we're all traveling on this, on, on this journey called life, and we'll all get to the same place. Um, so I, I started like, understanding what Sikhism was about. Um, and then one day I was going through the Sikh scriptures in English, and I wanted to understand who God is and like, what does he look like? What is his personality? What is he all about? Um, so I came across a scripture which said that God is holy and God is powerful, but you cannot know him. And that if you want, but if, like, you cannot know him, but if he wants to know you, then that's, that's possible. But all your hard work and all the things that you do in life could potentially amount to nothing because God doesn't know you and doesn't want to know you and is kind of absent. And so I read that and I considered, like, the implications of, of that. And I was like, no, I don't think this is true. Uh, I just had kind of like a sense that, that to just keep searching. Like the truth is out there and this can't be it. Um, so when I was um, 21, I was going to McMaster University. I was studying science. And I met a friend who shared the gospel with me. Uh, it was the first time I had ever, ever heard the gospel. Um, I had a lot of friends who were Christians, who were crosses, who told me they went to church, um, but no one actually ever told me what that meant. Um, so the, for the very first time, um, it was explained to me like who Jesus was. I hadn't heard the name Jesus before. I'd seen some videos on, um, on what his life was like, but I had never really explained like why he died and like who he was. Um, so she explained from the father's perspective, which was, I thought, really interesting looking back on it now that she shared, like, why the father gave up his own son and why he thought that was necessary and that he did that so that we would be reconciled to him and that we would come to know him through what Jesus did on the cross. Um, so I, I thought about what she said and, like, it felt very true and, like, um, it kind of resonated with me on some, some level, but I also still didn't understand it. And then she asked me a question, and the question was, would you like to invite Jesus into your heart? And just saying that to someone who is not coming from the Christian faith, um, it kind of sounds kind of weird, <laughs> because it's like, what does that mean, like, invite Jesus into your heart? Like, where does that, like, like it's hard to understand what that phrase means, and like, um, so I kind of was spooked out a little. So, <laughs> so I said, uh, no, not really. Like, I, I'm not interested in kind of thing, right? Just trying to be polite in Canadian. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I went home and, like, I thought about, like, you know, what she said. And I was kind of, like, really wrestling in my mind about, is it true? Is it not true? Um, like, it sounds like a really cool God, um, that somebody would, like, die for you, who, who I don't even know. So I, being a scientific, very logical person, I created a test. So my test was to figure out whether what she, say, what she said was true or not. 
um, and the methodology was prayer. So I thought I'm going to pray, and if nothing happens, and that means she's you know a crazy religious person, um, and if something happens or something changes, then I know that God is real, and I always had a really high value for truth. So I thought that wherever this road leads me, um, I'm going to follow it because I'm pursuing truth. Um, so I. I prayed generally that night. I said, God, if you're real, um, please show me um, somehow that in a way that I would understand. So I went to sleep, um, and I had a dream. And in this dream, um, I felt like somebody was walking up to me, um, and they put like a white cloth over my body, and um, I, I sensed that in, in the dream, and I felt like the, I could sense... Um, like darkness and good around me, um, and then I felt like there was this darkness that was trying to overcome me, and I was I was fighting it, and then I felt like I didn't have any more strength left, and no one told me to do this or never seen this in a movie or anything, um, but in the dream I called upon the name of Jesus, and when I did that, I felt like the darkness, whatever it was, um, no longer was around me, and in my dream I saw Jesus. And he was standing there smiling at me, and which I kind of thought was a little odd because, like, I, I, didn't, know who he, like, I didn't know who he was. I, I didn't have a relationship with him. Um, and so I'm like, why are you smiling at me, right? Um, and it's interesting looking back on the dream because um, he's, he's standing at, at my door. And I, even in that moment, had the option of, either to go up to him or ignore the whole thing. Um, and I decided to go up to him, and no words were really exchanged, but he placed his um, hand over my head. And in our culture, that is like a, it's a cultural motif, which means um, I'm giving you all my inheritance. So, um, yeah, and so in that moment, it, I felt a lot of peace and a lot of love, um, and then I woke up from that dream, and I was like, oh, wow, like, what just happened? And, like, like what, I, what I prayed for, like, there was actual results. And I've never had that happen before as a Sikh. Like, I've never had prayer be answered. Um, so that was a really confusing thing for me to go through that because I had, like, no grid for what, like, what it means to be a Christian. What does it mean to follow Jesus? Like, what is the Bible? How do you even read it? Um, church like what is that what do you do there (laughs) so like I had all these questions and I was kind of like navigating it on my own and trying to figure things out Um, I knew that Jesus is real but I didn't know (laughs) what that meant was he a real person like was was he a historical figure Um, is the resurrection true so I had all these like very different questions so I started I just started reading everything I could um, on Christianity and trying to be rational about it um, and examining evidences, uh, especially for the resurrection. Uh, Because the more I read, the more I realized that both skeptics and scholars were saying, um, if you want to know if Jesus is true, um, disprove the resurrection. And if you do that, you basically dismantle Christianity. Um, So I started slowly uh, going through different books, um, different apologetic resources, and trying to figure out if that was true or not, if the resurrection was true or not. So I came across a lot of resources which were talking about the multiple witnesses of the resurrection and how it wasn't just something that one person only knew about, Um, that it was something that kind of spread like wildfire and that a lot of people believed it and they witnessed it. And then, so knowing that a lot of people witnessed it, there's only a very few little possibilities about how you can rationalize that. So either all those people are telling the truth or one of the reasons the skeptics use a lot is that there was a mass hallucination, which isn't very, isn't possible. Um, You can have a lot of people hallucinating at the same time, but they can't all hallucinate the same thing. So for me, that was uh, convincing evidence that um, the resurrection is true, and then by default, Christianity is true. So Sam, can I ask, just really quickly, um, 
because we need to start wrapping this up. How did your family react? And then, if you can tell us that quickly, then Imran, if you could just tell us how do we begin to minister to Punjabi and Sikh people in our community. Uh, how did your family react? Oh, okay. Um, so, I didn't tell my family for a few months because I really wanted to like um, understand what I really believe in, how to communicate it properly. Um, so when I did like come out um, to my family, um, <laughs> there was a lot of very different reactions, and they were all negative. Which I don't know. In just being a new believer, I didn't really think that was going to be the case. I thought they were going to be like, "Oh, great, you found the truth! Like that's so awesome." But it was a lot of really negative um, feelings. <laughs> so my dad, he in our in our in our families, um, usually our dad has a lot of say in what goes on, what's acceptable, what's allowed, what's not allowed. And um, I remember him saying, no daughter of mine is allowed to be a Christian. Um, so for him, for me to be a Christian was a very disrespectful thing to do, and he was really against it. Um, my sisters were really confused um, because we didn't really have a strong religious background. Like We kind of somewhat just believed. I mean, just kind of followed things. And so that 360 turnaround was really confusing, and um, they had a lot of negative emotions. And so, Imran, just in a, a few minutes here, in the closing minutes, you work with uh, a ministry here at the church called Punjabi Connection, which, plug for Imran, uh, they meet after the 1130 service. Could you tell us what that is, and then, uh, you know, how we could begin to get involved and begin to have conversations with um, what it might look like for us to begin to try and minister to Sikh people in our community? I think just the simple thing is basically talk to people. You do not need to know everything about the religion um, that you're trying to engage with. Um, so that's number one. Just simply talk to them. Go talk to them. Find out who they are. What brought them to Canada? What do they do? Um, just like you meet people here and you get to know each other, like asking, hey, how long have you been coming here? What brought you here? Uh, welcome. J just simply uh, and ask them questions rather than telling them about yourself. Hey, this is what I do. This is who I am. Because I will not be interested if Andy starts telling me about himself. I wrote a book, for example. All he does. On it. Whatever. <laughs> just an example, right? Okay. I... Um, He's almost a doctor. Fix me up after this with my cough, man. Um, but honestly, if Andy start ta starts telling me about who he is, this is what he does, I will be like, no, I'm not interested. But if Andy starts asking me, hey, what do you do here? What brought you to Canada? Or all sort of questions that he's inquiring, and he's showing interest in my life, I will be inclined to respond and engage with him. Right, And that will start two-way conversation right there. And that's how you find out who they are, what they believe, um, where they stand in life, and all sort of issues. So you, you spend time with them. Um, and the, the, the other thing is, you, we, we do not need to treat people as a project. Because often that's the, that's the concept. Like, hey, this is my project for the next year. I'm going to work with them for the next six months or a year, and after them, I'm going to pull the plug and do something else. So this is my project for the next 10 months or whatever. I'm going, to, no, treat them as friends. Don't th treat them as a project because it's horrible. If you treat them as a friend, you will see the result. And the other thing is, uh, which I'll just tell you guys, that in our Western culture, we are result-oriented people. I want to see the result. If I am talking to a Punjabi person who's a Sikh, and I've been hanging out with this person for six years or five months, I have not seen him come to church or her. Uh, man, they're not responding. It's not up to you. It's up to God, okay? So you might get frustrated. Like, man, I'm not seeing the result. Therefore, I should move on to someone else. You're treating them as a project again, right? But if you're like, no, I'm going to be faithful and continue to do what, just hang over them, that, that's, that's all you need to do. Uh, so what we do on Sunday, basically, uh, we, we have uh, ESL classes um, for Punjabi people. So when they go to a coffee shop, the scene that you get saw, they don't struggle with that. Um, 
and so just help them basically practice their English. Often it's spoken, um, but the goal is also just to connect with them and get to know them and provide a place where they can feel loved and cared for. Uh, because So these are the comments I hear from people. Man, we go to the temple, uh, Sikh temple, Hindu Mandir. Everyone's just so serious. But when I come to church, you guys all smiling and just so friendly. Why, why is that? And there's my opportunity to talk about why, is that, why we, we were like that. Right? So... You, you, Often, action speaks louder than the words. So, so that, that, that's what we do. The other thing we do, we have a community group for Indo-Canadian um, uh, people. So whoever comes to church, uh, if they're Punjabi, brown, they're welcome to come to church um, uh, to our lunch, have uh, butter chicken, right? Oh, come on. Um, Danny will often come and like, hey, is there any leftover? I'm like, no, just leave. Um, <laughs> although is, I is there mango shake? Time, is there mango shake? Um, <clears throat> No, but anyway, so people come and just have lunch, and we talk about the sermon that was just preached, and then uh, if they have any other question from their personal reading, and we pray for each other too. Um, so that, that's what we have. Um, so I think Danny also asked me, like, hey, if there are um, other ways that you guys can be involved, um, I coach with the Punjabi club in Abbotsford. It's called Abbotsford United Soccer Club. Is that your next question? Well, I'm actually about to tell you out of time, but uh, one minute. Just, okay, uh, <laughs> so let me just wrap it up, though, quickly. So I coach with Abbotsford United Soccer Club. It's all p- brown kids. There are very few white kids or other color. Um, but our goal is to have as many uh, Christian coaches, boys and girls, um, it, as many as we can out there in the community to hang out with them. So if you are interested to play soccer or even just let you know, I'm not good at soccer, but I'll be happy to be the manager or assistant coach, they're looking for people, and my goal is to provide as many Christian coaches as possible to influence that community in order to engage with them. Also, we have soccer camp coming up uh, uh, in July, third week of July, so if you want to help out with that, you can talk to myself, Tiffany, or Yvonne. Uh, they're, they're all here, so just talk to one of us. I'd we'll, uh, love to have you there. There's free lunch there, too, by the way. <laughs> then people will come. You free lunch, they'll come. Um, Look, I want to invite the worship team up. We're going to transition now into a time of communion and worship. But Imam, would you pray for us uh, just as we close out here? Absolutely. So yeah, let's pray. Uh, Father, we are grateful um, for this time together that we can gather together and uh, worship you. You kind and good Father, that how you brought us all together here to worship you. Father, pray that as we continue to worship you, you find us faithful. And I ask that as uh, we just talked about Sikhism, that... Um, that you use this time to accomplish your purpose and equip each one of us, encourage us and challenge us um, to love you and to love the people you brought in our city. So we ask that you do this for our good and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.